um, that contains um, the drop boxes as well as uh, an overview of the project, what you need to do for the design, what you need to do for the completed project. What I did is I came up with a sample plan. All right, here's the different documents. I came up with a sample plan of if I was doing a project, what, it, what, what the design might look like. Now, one thing I will say is you don't need to duplicate what I've done exactly. All right, this is meant to be a, a sample, not a, a template, if that makes sense. Um, so you can take it and you can go in somewhat of a different direction, but um, I, I think it was useful to provide some concrete um, examples of the stuff that we're trying to, to accomplish uh, for the design phase. Um, remember, a, a lot of the design phase is taken up not even doing, you know, coding, not, not creating HTML files and CSS files and all that, but by taping, taking a step back and trying to see the bigger picture and trying to think about the purpose of your site, the goals that you as an organization are trying to achieve um, with the site and the goals that your users are, are trying to achieve with the site. So I want to give a, a concrete example of this. And I don't hold this up to be the perfect uh, plan either. It's something I did. Um, you know, I, I, I really put myself in the shoes of, of, of my students. I probably did this like the day before I was going to deliver the lecture on it, the day before it was due. So um, don't, don't view this as a perfect, view it as an example. All right. Oops. All right. So it's broken up into sections. Again, the five sections, the strategy, the requirements, the structure, the wireframes, and then the prototype. All right. I don't have an example prototype, and we'll, we'll talk about the prototype when we get to that point. All right. Strategy. Here I have just a little bit of a paragraph explaining an overview of, of what it is. Essentially what I'm saying is me as a fan of jazz music want to spread the word, want to be an evangelist towards it. And I also narrow the scope of the project a little bit by me saying that um, yes it's about jazz music but it's geared towards listeners as opposed to um, musicians and it's geared towards the novice as opposed to the expert. All right. So I'm already sort of uh, starting to move in the direction of defining my personas All right, by targeting and taking a topic that could be very broad and narrowing it down. You know. um, it's implied, it isn't explicitly stated, but it's implied that I'm talking about adults, All right, not like, not like grade school kids or, or even high school kids. All right. So the implication is that just the adult general listener that's not particularly an expert in the field. All right. So when you're thinking of your project idea, you know, it's not enough to say that you know, I want to create a website about uh, baseball, about gardening, about any particular topic. Take it a step further and, and pick the aspect that you want to emphasize. All right. The sites that we're making are pretty small, so you're not going to be able to cover um, a broad topic too thoroughly. All right. So you're better off picking a small area and focusing on that as opposed to trying to, to, to cover everything and, and not doing a good job of it. My goals. I might knock off a half point on these goals because they're not really measurable if I was grading my own work. All right. S pardon me? You're a tough grader. Yeah, I'm a tough grader, yeah, yeah. Um, keep in mind that you're not always going to have measurable goals. All right, uh, just by the nature, by the nature of the site and what I'm trying to accomplish, it's kind of tough for me to do that. I could have the greatest site in the w uh, website in the world, and it's not as though I'll be able to look and see that, you know, worldwide there's a 10% increase in jazz record sales, you know. If a few records were sold uh, in addition to, uh, you know, uh, the ones that normally were sold, I've probably done a good job on my site. You know, we're, not, we're talking about 
something that, that isn't uh, a high volume to begin with and a website, even if it's effective in achieving its goals, is not necessarily going to make a measurable thing. So you measure what you can. Um, it's better if it can be measurable, but if it's not, it's not. And you, you then have to go with something a little less tangible. All right. So I've defined my three user goals, and I've identified them as O1, O2, and O3. Uh, and then likewise, the user goals, I've identified U1, U2, and U3. All right. And I know what some of you are thinking. U2 is not a jazz band, but that's not what I mean here. All right. Um, We'll see where I use the, that coding in a second here. I, I think I did it in this. If not, I'll talk about how you could use that coding. These are the things I want to achieve. I want to broaden the popularity of jazz. I want to expand the horizons of listeners. I want to give an overview. Now, how I'm going to do that is going to come into play in the next case. Likewise, Find other musicians similar to the musicians that they already like. Find biographical information about jazz musicians. Get information that will assist them in building uh, a jazz library. Again, if I were grading this, I would comment that this one almost smells more like a requirement than a goal. All right. The other two are goals, clearly, because that's what you, that's what you're going to visit the site for. It's like, hey, I've heard some records. I like them. I want to expand my horizons and I want to know what other recordings to buy. That's a reasonable goal. I guess finding out biographical information could be considered a reasonable goal too. All right. Here's my personas. And again, I, these are all images licensed with a Creative Commons license from Flickr. All right. I took them all from the same person. And I created three personas. All right. Brad listened to jazz growing up because his father was a fan. He stopped listening. Now he's getting older and he's getting back into it again. Uh, Mary Nelson is taking a jazz appreciation class at a community college. Doesn't know much about the music other than what she learned in class, but likes some of it and wants to explore it further. And finally, this guy, Bob Jones, has a few friends. He likes some um, contemporary jazz. He wants to go back and, and find uh, more information about the classics. Are these the only three personas that I could come up with? Of course not. All right. Um, depending on the size of the project and, and all that, you, know, you could come up with a, a bunch of uh, uh, personas. You know, if you talk about Learning Community College's website, we already defined probably a dozen or so personas, if I recall correctly, when we talked about this the other day. But for the purpose of this, I'm stating that you come up with three. All right? Three feels about right, given the size of the project that we're doing. All right? Um, and they're three different. They're, they're, three, they're, they're, three, they, they're representative of three people that I could see coming to this with a slightly different slant, maybe, than, than, uh, uh, than each other. So it's not as though they have totally different goals, but um, they, have, they, they have different subtleties in, in, their, in, their, in what they're after that, that makes it uh, interesting as opposed to just having one persona. Now, one thing that I have debated doing is Really, each persona could have its own goals. All right? And I've debated changing the assignment to do that, but I haven't yet for this semester. So you only need to come up with three user goals. All right? Really, each persona is going to have a set of goals. And they're not necessarily going to have three. All right? I picked three goals again because I have in my mind how big of a site I want All right, from you. I don't want you creating a million page site. Or let me rephrase that. If you want to create a million page site, have a blast. I don't want to require you to create a million page site. All right? So three goals, yeah, that sounds about appropriate for the kind of uh, thing that we're doing. Three is an arbitrary number. All right? But I am asking that you consider like the stuff that's important because that's a big aspect of web design is given the goals of the, you know, defining the goals, but not putting every possible thing that people might want to accomplish uh, as a goal, you know.
from time to time, you know, you hear people when they're, when they're looking at the requirements of any, or really any kind of software, whether it be web stuff or desktop applications or whatever, say things like, well, the user might want to do that. Well, yeah, the problem is, is you could do that really all day and you could come up with tons of features and devote a lot of time and effort to something that really doesn't add that much value. I'll give an example. I worked on a website for a chemical company, all right? And this is actually pre-9-11, all right? And so I imagine that the conditions I'm going to describe are like times 100 now, all right, post-9-11. But they, they created, uh, or, or they, they sold chemicals that like, like biological labs use, all right? So if you're doing testing, you know, if you're, if you're doing research and some topic in biology, you might buy chemicals from them to do whatever it is that you do. All right? Now, some of the chemicals are potentially hazardous, of course. Right? You know, it makes sense, right? So you have to be careful with them. When you ship those internationally, as you can imagine, there's a lot of like security issues and such and such. So calculating the shipping to ship something like that internationally is a giant pain. All right? Very difficult. All right? If I recall correctly, into one of the countries, you could only ship this kind of thing to like a couple different places. So like, you could only ship it to the post office in such and such city, and if you lived in another city, you had to come and pick it up and present ID and that sort of thing. And again, pre-9-11, after 9-11, I'm sure it's, it's a lot worse than that. Well, incorporating that logic into the web application that we created. And again, we're not doing this kind of programming, but still the idea remains the same. Incorporating that logic into the site that we were developing probably took just the, the portion of it to calculate the shipping cost and nothing else for international sales probably took a quarter of the resources. So Everything else about ordering the chemicals online and displaying it and search and any other functionality you can think of on this website was three quarters. One quarter was figuring out one number, <laughs> all right, for an international sale, all right? Now, this gets done and this gets implemented. Who knows if they even had any international sales, you know? They may have had a few, but they could have just as well said, for international sales, call this number, all right? And they could have got off way cheaper on the website and probably only had, you know, a, a minimal, uh, uh, you know, interruption with the calls. The point is, is someone when they were developing this was saying yes to everything when the question was asked, do you think our users might want to do this? Yeah, they might want to. Do you think that while in the middle of me typing my resume, I might want to make a cup of coffee. Therefore, I should integrate into Microsoft Word a little option that I can control my coffee maker. Yeah, I might want a cup of coffee while I'm writing my resume. That would be awesome, right? right? Except when you consider that, A, if they put that in, would you be able to find it in the menus? And would that get you away uh, from the things that you want to do 90% of the time, like, you know, change the font of something or whatever. All right. So the point in limiting you and forcing you to limit the number of goals is, is a case of selection, because to a big degree, that's what we're doing. Remember, we want to make the common things simple and allow for the less common things. So in the case of the chemical company, if we made the typical ordering that colleges and universities here in the United States did, if we made that simple and we gave an option for international like contact your local sales rep if you want an international order or something like that, then we probably could have done a much better job in terms of budget and simplified the whole process. So I want you to be selective in thinking of this. All right. Again, three is an arbitrary number. Um, I wouldn't go much, I wouldn't go less than three. I wouldn't really go much more. I mean, if you come up with five goals, that's probably okay. If you come up with uh, 10 goals, you're probably doing too much work. Spring's coming, 
it's going to be nice weather. You don't want to be spending all your time working on a project like that. All of this constitutes the, the first section, the strategy section. And again, it's all about goals. It's all about defining our audience, defining our audience's goals, and defining our goals as the creator of the site. That's the purpose that you want to achieve in this section of the document. So the first section. The second section is a list of requirements. Now, I didn't do it here. But one thing that's very useful would be things like taking the letters that I put next to them and putting them next to the requirement. In other words, one of the user's goals is to find biographical information about jazz musicians. Well, site's going to have biographies. Okay, that relates to this goal. Alright, so it's useful to do that. Alright, I could put a notation indicating that this requirement maps to this goal. Now remember, it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one relationship. All right. Um, one goal could map to several requirements. And a given requirement could address several goals. All right. Um, but what you want to make sure is when you're done, every goal has at least one requirement related to it. If you've identified this as one of the most important things that your site needs to help you achieve or help your users achieve, you better be putting something on your site to actually achieve that. If you don't, you're missing the boat. The reverse is also true. If I'm putting stuff on my site, each requirement better relate to one of my goals. Because if it doesn't relate to one of my goals, then do I really need it? Alright, do I really need it? I then list for each biography different aspects that I'm going to be talking about. Spelling error, that's a couple points off. And so on down the line. Alright. I assume that I matched all my requirements. Uh, all my requirements map, map to the goal, so I, I have a, a requirement for each goal and a goal for each requirement. Link to Amazon for one or two best recording, you know, clearly that relates to the, the one person's goal of building a, a jazz library, because that'll help them purchase uh, the music. If I had as a goal to earn a little pocket cash, for example, by being like an Amazon affiliate, I could potentially, this could potentially address that one as well. And that would be maybe a case of a, of a more tangible goal, because I might say I want to earn so much, you know, from this site. That is the requirements phase. And again, the requirements is simply a list of things that are going to be on the site. They're not really organized into pages. Alright, that comes in the next step. We have all this information that we want to put on our site. Alright, that's the requirement phase. Hopefully that will help us achieve our goals. That's the strategy phase. Now we've got to organize that information. And we're going to organize the information, first of all, by doing a structure chart. I'm doing a simple hierarchy where I have, and it's flat, it's not tall, where I've decided to break things down primarily by instrument. All right? You could argue, is that the best way to do it? And I explained why I picked my organizing principle. All right? I use a simple, I explain why I picked a simple hierarchy. And for most of you, the, 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 the no-brainer kind of answer is you picked a simple uh, hierarchy because that's what you do for this size of a website. As far as the organizing principle goes, again, remember the sporting goods store. We could organize our stuff a bunch of different ways. Why did we pick the way that we did? We should rationalize that. We should show 
people that we thought about other options. All right, and here's why we've done that. All right, when I talk about showing people this, what do I mean? I mean, typically, when you build a website, you're building it for someone else. All right, you're either building it for people within your company, for another department, a marketing department, or some other department, or you're building it from someone who's contracting you to do that. So you want to let them know the thought process that you've gone through because if there's any problem with it, they'll tell you, oh, well, no, I don't think those people would, I don't think my personas would be able to tell the difference between a trumpet and a saxophone if that's what they truly thought, all right? Or I don't think organizing the goods and the sporting goods by uh, gender is a good idea because sometimes, you know, people... Um, you know, a woman might still want a sweatshirt that is, quote, a man's sweatshirt, or whatever, all right? They can give you insight based on your rationale for picking a particular organizing principle. You will also document this to just keep everyone on the team that's working with you on the same page. Keep in mind that, you know, some web projects are just single people working on them, a single developer, and they're, they're doing everything, all right? Other projects involve, you know, teams. Maybe someone doing graphics. Maybe someone doing some sort of back-end programming that deals with databases and stuff. And other people doing, dealing with the user interface and so on. So depending on the size of the project, there could be a team. Well, in addition to your client, you want to keep your team on the same page as well. So the purpose of the design document, even if, you're the only one that's working on the site and you're developing it for yourself, the design document is still important because it forces you to think through the problem. All right? Um, it's like the math teacher that says, show me your work. All right? Why do they want you to show you the work? Well, so that you just didn't guess at the right answer. A train leaves Chicago at this time and um, they'll crash in Toledo. You know, maybe you just guessed at the answer. Documenting your work like this shows that you've gone through the thought process of what you need to put on the site, how you need to organize it, what your goals are, and so forth. In this case, I, I justify my rationale by breaking it down by musical instrument because I thought that a couple other choices would be to break it down by era and break it down by st or break it down by style of music. You know, you could have old New Orleans jazz, you could have big band jazz and all that. And I went against that for a couple reasons. First of all, if someone wanted to look for other records they like, and they're not a particularly sophisticated jazz listener, they might not really have any idea what era that music is from. All right? It's also problematic, what about someone who's recording today who's playing a style of music from the 1940s? Where does that go era-wise? Does that go now because they're making the records now? Or does that go into the 1940s because they're making records in the style of the 1940s? It just seemed too confusing for the novice to break it down either by era or by style. That might work for me who understands it and who knows about it, but from the perspective of my personas, they're not going to know that. On the other hand, they're definitely going to know musical instrument. They hear a trumpet player and say, wow, I really like that trumpet player. Most people, even if you don't know anything about jazz, can tell the difference between a trumpet and a piano, or a trumpet and a saxophone, or trumpet and drums. So therefore, I figured, well, that would be a good way to organize it for the novice. All right? If a novice hears a particular piano player they like, well, maybe there's other piano players they like. Maybe they're, you know, maybe that, that's sort of where their tastes run. So I have it organized by um, instrument. And then I have a more detailed argument for that. Again, it's important to show your thought process. You know, designing is a lot about making choices. You have a lot of choices. You have choices at every level. This document is a document of your choices. And it shows that you've spent some time thinking about the choices you've made as opposed to like, 
Well, that's the first thing I thought of. All right, so I'm going to do it that way. Or that makes sense to me. All right. So that's how I'm going to do it. So third section, structure section. Fourth section is my wireframes. Were I grading this, I would probably write and say, really these aren't three different wireframes, really this is one wireframe and you could have gotten by with just one wireframe and a couple of notes. And I would have said, yeah, that's okay. I probably wouldn't have taken points off for it unless I was really, really in a bad mood. All right. That's a joke. I don't grade based on the mood I'm in. All right. <laughs> what this shows, though, is this shows the basic structure. All right. My home page is going to look like this. I'm going to have a banner that goes across the top. I'm going to have a navigation that goes along this side. And I'm going to have a paragraph explaining the purpose of the site and some images. That's really all a wireframe does or needs to do is show on a very high level how each page is going to be organized. Now if you notice, my instrumental page is virtually the same, has the same navigation, has the same banner. The only difference is the content area is a little bit different. I, I guess I didn't have to draw another wireframe to do that. I could have just put a note to say in the instrument section it's going to have this stuff in it. Likewise with my index links. It's really the same wireframe. I just have some notes there. But that's what a wireframe is. And wireframes, again, um, typically most of your wireframes are going to look very similar. All right. Why are they going to look very similar? Number one, all of you are doing approximately the same size website. So there's probably not going to be the need for there to be a more involved structure. If I was doing, for example, a gigantic website, I might have, in addition to my main navigation, I might have a sub-navigation section. I might have a news bar as a sidebar uh, on it or something along those lines. So if I was doing a bigger site, I might have more sections uh, than this. But for a smaller site, this is probably pretty typical. But the only other thing that you might want to put is you might want to put a footer on it. So that's one reason why your wireframes are going to look similar. Second reason why your wireframes are going to look similar is people have been training to view your site ever since they started surfing on the web. All right. What do I mean by that? I mean that there's certain sort of conventions on the web. All right. Just like there's certain conventions with books. All right. We've got a book here. Someone tell me where the table of contents in this book is. In the front. Wow. You were psychic. All right? Because the table of contents, sure enough, is in the front. Where's the index of it? At the back. I could probably go on and find other characteristics. Which way does it open? Well, at least in this culture, it opens this way. I know other cultures possibly works the other way. Uh, other way. I know, for example, like uh, some manga opens this way. All right, but. Uh, Typical books in Western culture would open this way. So I know that. I would know, even, if, even before looking at the, at the words or the picture on here, if this was laying here and I was fumbling around in the dark, I would know that this is the right orientation for the book. I know that that's probably not it, that this isn't it, that this isn't it, that I might guess I'd have a 50-50 chance because if it was truly in the dark, that would look right or that would look right. My point is, is that we know an awful lot of stuff because we've read books before and we've seen books. So we know how books are formatted and how they look. 
We have a similar sort of thing with websites. It's not like, you know, you had to go to school to learn that, just using the web. You find that there's certain conventions that take place. For example, usually at the very top of the page is some sort of banner that says like what the page is. Now, that banner can be a little different. It doesn't have to go all the way across. Maybe the banner's like this. Maybe the banner's like this. Maybe the banner's like this, but I would think that would be fairly rare. All right. The point is, is that there's something in a handful of positions that is the banner of the page, and we know that, and we look for it. And if we encounter a website that doesn't have it, it's going to throw us for a little, a little bit of a loop. All right. If, for example, there was a book where the table of contents was in the back, and the index was in the front, we'd figure it out eventually, but it would be a little confusing at first. All right. By the same token, along with the banner, there's navigation. Typically the navigation is either here or here or sometimes, especially on a bigger site, maybe in both places. All right. Does this mean that you have to follow this format? Does this mean that you are wrong if you do anything remotely different? I would say no, but I would say there are places for you to be creative and there's places for you not to be creative. If I'm designing a book, there's plenty of room for me to be creative in writing the book and in illustrating it and so on. Where I put the table of contents, probably isn't the right spot for me to pick to be creative, right? I'm going to put my table of contents in the middle. That way, no matter where you are in the book, you're only a few pages away from the, you know, what's the point of that, all right? Um, the point is, is that if you deviate from these sort of um, de facto standards, you better have a good reason, all right? And unless you got a really good reason, then you're probably better off taking the boring, straightforward, basic, however you want to call it, simple way, and show, showcasing your creativity in some other way. All right, I guess that's my thought on this. Pick your spots, all right? There's times to be creative, there's times to do things that are unconventional and iconoclastic and all that, but there's also times to, to play it by the book, all right, and to do that. You want to pick your spots and do it in a way that's going to make impact as opposed to doing it in a way just to be different than the crowd. All right. There is uh, Jacob Nielsen, which I talked about in some of the classes, has something he calls Nielsen's Law. And Nielsen's Law states that um, no matter how great your website is, people spend more time on other websites than yours. Right? So Google's a great website. I spend a lot of time on Google, but I spend more time on sites that are not Google, all right? And the same thing applies for any other site that you can, you can name. I don't spend more than half my time on one site, no matter what. What does that mean? That means that the way the other sites work and look and so on is important and you ought to pay attention to that. Let me show you an example of that. What does text that is underlined mean? means it's a link. Don't ever underline text unless it's a link. Why? Because no one else underlines, under, underlines text unless it's a link. Let me show you an example of a site that obviously was missing that day in class when I went over this. And I hate to pick on these guys, but they're such a good example of 
something bad that that I have to. All right. Yeah, I'm not crazy about the colors and all that, but we can forgive them for that. Here. Northeast Ohio Jazz Calendar as of 3-1. Click more below for the Northeast Ohio Jazz Calendar. Do you know how many times I come to the site? What do you think I click? I click this. I click it hard, you know. Doesn't matter. They're telling me to click this more down here. And that is the actual link. Why they would do that, I have no idea. All right? Real small thing, but what's the real problem here? The real problem here is they violated the de facto standard of blue underline equals link. And therefore, it confused me. This is the equivalent of having like the table of contents in the middle of the book. All right? Maybe not that bad, but it's equivalent to doing something in a very non-standard way. All right? If they even said something like, oh, click the link below or click the more below, even if it didn't say it, you know, even if it had the same verbiage, if it wasn't blue and underlined, it probably would be more straightforward. All right? Can I have a question? Yeah. If you're decorating your link, should you always keep, should you not play around with colors then and keep the visited always blue even if it doesn't look, doesn't look really nice while you look at one on your site? Excellent question. The statement was that does that mean that I should never deviate from the blue underline? And the answer to that is no. It's one of those statements from symbolic logic. You know, P implies Q doesn't mean that not Q implies not P or something like that. I don't know. I wish my geometry teacher was here. If you're going to make something blue and underlined, it better be a link. The reverse is not true. If it's a link, it better be blue and underlined. Okay? As long as you adopt some sort of convention that is obvious to people, then it's okay if the links are not blue and underlined. All right, I guess is what I would say. So, let's, let's pick um, a site. Um, where do I want to go today? Well, let's go to Microsoft. What are the links on this page? Products download. Products download. Those aren't blue and underlined, yet it's quite clear from their placement and, and from the white space around them and all that that those are the links. So that's clear that those are links, even though they're not blue and underlined. All right? And sure enough, those are. And if we go over here, these are also links. And it's pretty obvious they're links, even though they're not blue and underlined. So no, you don't have to make, you don't have to keep your links blue and underlined. But if you make something blue and underlined, it better be a link. And and in fact, I would extend that to say if you are going to, um, if you're going to underline something, it should be a link. There's other ways to emphasize things other than underlining because people think links. Is it? Is it it feels a little bit like there's a difference here also, in my mind, that we're sort of navigating around Microsoft's site as opposed to linking to some information someplace else. So I, it, it seems like if Microsoft were going to send me to CNET, okay. that that should be distinguished from their convention. All right. Very good. That, that's, an interesting, uh, that's an interesting comment. The, the statement was made that... Um, there are navigation links that take you to different portions of your site. There are also external links to like references that, that go somewhere else. And the question was made is should they be somehow distinguished visually? And I guess my answer is that's not a bad idea. You could, you could somehow visually, and again you could do that via styles, do that via classes, external link versus uh, internal link. 
And I've seen some places they'll do a little icon next to it. You know, they indicate it's an external link and all that. But yeah, that's a reasonable thing. Um, the thing there would be consistency and um, the fact that the styling you do is actually mean some, something. In other words, you're not arbitrarily with no rhyme or reason making certain links. And then again, you'll gradually educate your users. Hey, that means an external link. All right, but yeah, it's, it's a very good point. But you're doing that purposefully. You're doing that with some rationale as opposed to I'm just going to make some different links, different colors. We look at Apple, same sort of thing. Is there any doubt that these are the links? No. Why is that? Based on the position. Notice here, links within this section look different. Or, or how do I want to put this? It's obvious to people that this is a link, and it's obvious to people that this is a link, even though they look different. All right? And it's, it, it's, it's amazing. So, you know, uh, it, it, how do I want to say? It's, it's very deliberately and artfully done. And what we know based on conventions of the way websites work, we, you know, helps us out to do and identify those things as well. Whereby down below we've got just what I would say a reference mm -hmm. structure. Right. Informational structure. Right. Absolutely. The, the, the manner in which it's organized, it provides a couple different ways to get into the same thing. All right. So for example, you know, Max in Education might take me to one of these pages, all right, but it's a different, different person coming in with different goals and viewing the data differently would, uh, you know, w might prefer one means of organization over the other. But they only have a couple. It's not like they have a million different ways of organizing it. Now, the blue underline is just, I think, the most obvious example I could think of, of how you'd want to follow conventions. The other things, I guess I would say, would be things like, you know, If you have some text here, probably should be your navigation. Don't just randomly have text going across there, you know. Make it obvious that it's navigation as opposed to just some phrases or whatever, I guess. I don't know. That's probably something no one would ever do, but, you know, it's probably worth mentioning anyhow. All right. The point is, is pick your spots to be creative and follow sort of the standards and, and, and uh, the general practices uh, that other folks do. All right. You want your site sort of to look like every other site, I guess is another way to put it. You don't want to look exactly the same. You want an individuality and you want it to stand out, but you also want to pick your spots. All right. You don't want it to be radically different where it's confusing to people. All right. The last step in the process is a prototype. And this is what amuses me to no end because I have had people copy this paragraph saying that they're not going to do a prototype because we've talked about them in class. It's like, no, that, I get to do that. I get to do that because I'm not turning this in for a grade. Life's not fair. You are turning this in for a grade, and therefore you do have to do a prototype. So this is notes, all right? And this is notes about a prototype, and we will likely spend uh, the next couple of classes talking about um, how to take our wireframes that we develop and turn them into a prototype, all right? Turn them into a prototype, all right? Um, one of the things that people start to get a little... ANSI, I guess I'd say, about this time in the class, is that people want really to be able to take more control of the layout of their page. 
Right now our pages just pretty much go linearly from the top to the bottom. And you know, hey, the first couple pages you do like that, oh, that's cool and all that. But then you get to a point like, I don't want it to look like that. I want the navigation over here and I want this over here. Well, we're going to move to that as we discuss how to take our wireframes and actually create templates and, and a prototype for it. What is a prototype? A sample, that's a good way to put it. Anyone else have another term? Like first run through, a rough draft. Test model or model. All right, all those are good answers. Question I get a lot of times from students is how complete should a prototype be? All right, and there's no definitive answer for that. All right. You don't want your prototype to be the finished site. You work too long on it if your prototype is the finished site. Why do I say that? Because what if the people you're developing the site come from look at it and say, that is horrible. I don't like this. It's bad. Then you've got to go and rework a lot of stuff. It's better for it to be a draft where you have completed some things, but you have not necessarily completed everything. By the same token, you don't want to underwork your prototype either and just have plain old HTML pages like we did the first week of class. Because that doesn't give anyone any idea of what the ultimate website is going to look like. So you sort of want to hit that sweet spot between dashing together a page that doesn't really look anything like the completed site or spending a lot of time and effort to actually complete the site and have a very polished prototype. You want to hit somewhere in between. I, one second. I guess what I would say is, is you want your prototype to give a sense of the overall look and feel of it. So fonts, colors, yeah, you want to kind of have those. A general sense of the layout, doesn't have to be perfect. And a sense of the navigation. Those are the main things that you want to convey because those are the things that are important. But if other things aren't finished, then that's no big deal. Yeah? So, yeah, I think that's my question. If we've got a fair amount of text, we can put Latin and gibberish in. Yes. Or just because we're, that's something that our youth or our, our clients or whatever might actually be writing for us. Correct. Correct. So, yeah, if you, if you don't have, or, or you don't have images, you could put just a stock image there if, if later on you're going to get images or, or Greek text. Now, the one thing I will tell you is that some users get really baffled when you show them that Greek text. And it's like, oh, what's that? I remember once, um, this is a different, um, different um, um, sort of environment, but the same sort of idea. I worked for a car rental company, and we were testing out some of our reports, and we wanted to show them the people and, and see if, if they liked the way the reports looked and all that. Well, I just made up data, you know. Okay, we have a Ford Taurus that costs $7,000, you know, and blah, blah, blah. blah. You, just put, you just make up numbers, right? And I remember, like, showing it to people and people saying, there's no way that you'd only pay $7,000 for a Ford Taurus. Come on, you know, those, those retail. And then they start like having a whole discussion about like, well, there was that one model. It's like, no, that model was disconnected. You know, and they lose track of really what's important here. All right. And I say this like kind of jokingly, but it is true. You, you want your users to stay on track. And if you are going to present something as a prototype, make it very clear to them you know, what is like good and finalized and what is still pending. So they don't like get hung up on something like, I thought you said you're going to have pictures of our showroom here. Here you have a picture of someone else's showroom. Well, yeah, okay, it's a prototype. I'm not done with it yet. That's not how it's going to look. People do respond better to seeing something tangible than all the other parts of this <laughs> design document. All this other design document is important to get you to the point of developing a prototype. But as far as getting feedback, that's probably where you will get most of your feedback. You do have to develop a bit of a thick skin when you do this. All right? Because again, despite your best efforts, it's tough sometimes to really get a sense of the requirements. Um, and, and when it's made tangible and when it's made into a prototype, 
oftentimes that's when your user's brain really kicks in, or your client's brain really kicks in, and they can tell you what they like, what they don't like, and all that. So it, you need to make it clear to them that it's okay to criticize it. And you, you, you yourself have to develop, develop a thick skin to say, well, you know, all right, that one didn't work, let's, let's try it again. At least now I have my answers about how they want it to look and how they want it to be organized. You know, that's another reason for not spending excessive amounts of time on it, is that if they do tear it apart, well, you know, you only wasted X amount of time instead of twice as much. All right, any questions about this? So your design document will consist of the four pieces that I have in this document along with a prototype. And a prototype should be sample, HTML, CSS, images, you know, um, the kind of things that you'd turn in for an assignment. Questions about this? What we will do next week is we'll start on the process of taking our wireframe and creating a template for it. All right, and we'll move into, you know, we've gone over the basics of HTML, we've gone over some of the basics of CSS. We'll get heavily into the CSS to really get the page to look exactly how we want to with the thought in mind that we're not just going to be developing one page here. We're going to be developing a suite of pages, you know, to, to uh, constitute an entire website. All right, questions? All right, we'll see you in lab.